like to welcome everyone to American Cannabis, sponsored by Cannabis Tech. I'm your host, Ella Smith, and today's topic is going to be about integrated pest management. Uh, our, our guest today is Todd Statzer. He is the Director of Integrated Pest Management at Urban Grow and brings over 30 years' experience in agriculture and horticulture. Todd also has a master's degree of science in plant pathology and phytopathology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a Bachelor's of Applied Science from Western Illinois University. Todd, thank you for being on today. Welcome. Ellis, thank you so much for having me. So, Todd, if you would, uh, give us a little bit about your background. I kind of touched on your school and kind of mentioned that you have 30 years' experience, but if you would, tell us about just how you got into horticulture, agriculture, uh, and what led you to come into cannabis? I sure can, Ellis. Um, you know, I entered into agriculture uh, as an agriculture ed student, so learning how to teach agriculture uh, with an emphasis in animal science, and that was from Western Illinois University. Uh, from there, I drove through from Central Illinois, Decatur area, to Western Illinois, and I would drive through the river areas and see vegetable production. And I really got interested in vegetable production because I lived in an area that was corn and soybeans and thought, hey, what a, what a great one-off. I'll be the only guy doing this. So I got into vegetable production and actually had a 40-acre vegetable farm, a 100-head herd of purebred Dorset sheep, um, and then I farmed 600 acres of corn and soybeans uh, with another gentleman. Of course, in 1985, that was a fairly large farm that's a spit in the bucket now. Um, as I got into vegetable growing, uh, I got intrigued by greenhouses and had, no, had seen tomatoes grown in Europe, in England, in greenhouses uh, because they didn't have a long enough season outside to get tomatoes. So that led me into greenhouses. Once I got into greenhouses, uh, then pest control became a, became a whole new uh, ball of wax. And I got into IPM. Uh, with tomatoes, uh, fighting white fly with Incarcia formosa. So that was my, my door in. Um, then began to read everything I could get. There was nothing on, uh, on the internet to teach you at that time. There wasn't even the internet to speak of yet, um, other than Prodigy, so I'm an old guy. Um, and that led me into the, the beginnings of IPM. As I uh, got my master's degree in crop science at the University of Illinois, um, I had the opportunity to get a job with the University of Illinois running one-third of their research facility. Uh, while at the research facility, I began to realize that we weren't using fully integrated pest management. We were still relying a lot on chemical controls. Went to my boss at the time and said, you know, I think since we're a university that pouts IPM, uh, we need to practice what we preach. Uh, I was then told, do it. So over that next four years, uh, another girl and I, Heather Lash, uh, actually began to implement full IPM. We cut our chemical applications at the University of Illinois by two-thirds. Um, thus saving money, uh, as people don't really think, you know, you've got that time of spraying and getting ready to spray and wear and tear on the sprayer and labor of your, of your person, all these things that come into the cost, whereas putting out bios, you know, one person can do it uh, in a relatively short amount of time. So as we began to implement that, um, you know, we realized that this was a real science um, and that we could do it successfully. I moved down from there to uh, the city of Milwaukee and ran their greenhouse and nursery for uh, two and a half years, uh, implementing IPM again and pulling them out of what was a, a, uh, a very poisonous um, uh, control, chemical control program um, and, and brought them into IPM. Um, at the end of that, I went on to work for the state of Illinois, and this is what brought me to cannabis, as a plant and pesticide inspector in the Bureau of Medicinal Plants. In other words, inspecting all facets of cannabis grows in Illinois. Um, during this time, I was approached by Urban Grow, and they asked me how I liked my job, and I said, well, I really like it, but I don't get to consult anymore um, because I'm an inspector and I have to have exact questions asked. 
Urban Grow said, boy, do we have a job for you. And three weeks, three weeks later, I joined the Urban Grow team um, and have been there just a little over a year now. And uh, we have really started to revolutionize IPM. Great, great. And so for the audience that doesn't know, um, you know, my company, we're a consulting company, American Cannabis Company, and we utilize Urban Grow as well. You know, we are consultants and we do this all over. But once again, we lean on this service from these guys. They really work with a lot of our customers across the U.S. and provide great, great consulting uh, on exactly how to manage and mitigate and just address IPM in general. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great service, and we're, we're really appreciative of what you guys do. And so um, I just want to put that out there, of uh, just my relationship with you guys and how it's been proven successful with multiple clients that I have um, in, in the U.S. And so, um, all right, well, let's, let's kind of dive into this, and let's really get to the heart of why we're here. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of read. There's a, there's a handful of, of um, definitions out there we'll, that, that we'll say of IPM, and I'm going to kind of read a concise one that I found, and let's kind of jump directly into this. All right, Todd, does that work for you? Sure. That works right, for so me. Here's what, here's, here's what I've got here. So at, at its heart, integrated pest management is about taking a combined approach to prevent and treat pest pressure in order to maximize yields and deliver positive economic and eco ecological results. And so um, there's some tools that are included that I found that I'm going to kind of list here, and then I'm going to, after this, you know, really deep dive into, the, in, into this with you, Todd. And so some of the tools that I found that uh, are listed are altering the surroundings, add beneficial insects and organisms, grow plants that resist pests, disrupt development of pests, prevention of pest problem developing, disrupt insect behaviors, and then use of pesticides. And so that's kind of uh, our playbook, we'll say. And so with that information, I'd love to really just hand it over to you, Todd. And let's dive into this and really understand what is IPM and how does Urban Grow kind of assist customers through this, uh, this service you offer with IPM? Sure, and I think if you think of IPM, you know, integrated pest management basically is all about systems. So when we look at, at a grow, uh, whether it be indoors or outdoors, you know, we're trying to analyze, you know, what kind of air circulation do you have? What's the ambient temperature uh, either outside, day temp, night temp, or inside? What's the, what's the you know, the, your average um, uh, you know, humidity. So all of these things go into figuring out uh, a grow. And, and to that end, you know, we look at, as a company, we look at the entire production schedule of whoever our client is. And so we understand what's their rotation. Are they doing single harvest? Are they doing perpetual harvests in, in large rooms? Um, and, and this helps us tailor that program to a specific grow because everybody has different challenges um, and different problems, and whether it be pests, because pests is such a wide term. So we're talking about insects, but we're also talking about molds, mildews, funguses, you know, all the other uh, problems that you could, you could infer uh, in a grow. In an outdoor grow, even weeds are considered pests. So, you know, it's a much larger picture um, than what people sometimes look at. Um, and, and so looking at that whole picture and then thinking about how do we go from chemical control uh, to biologic control. So in some states, you can't use any pesticides in flour at all, Illinois being one of them. Um, in other states, you can use uh, almost anything, and there's only a few left of those. Um, and, and then in others, we can only use 25B products. So once a grower starts trying to navigate, you know, what's allowed in their area, what's compliant, um, and then also what is, what is safe. So at, at, in Urban, at Urban Grow, what we try to look at is we're trying to look at producing the safest, um, economically viable crop for a producer. So we like to use what we call a true IPM approach, which is where we are utilizing chemicals um, in veg and then transferring over to biologics uh, in flour. 
Now that's driven by uh, the client as well as to how much one way or another they want to go. But in true IPM, we would be util utilizing all the tools in the drawer and, and deciding, you know, at times if you have a breakout, uh, biologics aren't going to keep up. We have preventative controls uh, and we have reactive controls. And basically, chemicals are reactive and bios are preventative. They have to be there first. 100%. If I can just say, as, as of recent, I, um, we were hired by a company to come in and take over a facility on the management side and had a, just such an intense infestation um, that we really, one, had to kill a lot of plants off, and two, we had to, um, you know, really use pesticides to really mitigate so that we could go back to biologicals. And so you see this quite a bit, and uh, we come in and try to clean these messes up, and so um, you, you, this is happening quite a bit all over. Um, okay, and so you know, how do you how do you measure you know um, outbreaks, and how do you measure how to really give someone a, a prescription for success? What, what what kind of tools do you have in your toolbox that really allow you to you know understand all these details so that you can give a, a customer you know the right recipe? So those and that and again, we use a questionnaire uh, that we send all of our clients. Um, that helps us understand uh, how they grow and also how their pest pressure is to start with. We then we then do a, a, a what you would call a kickoff call, basically, where with the client, and that helps us clarify uh, all the points because when we're looking at control, things that go into consideration, number of plants in the room, spacing between the plants, uh, size of the container, uh, you know. Are they doing a nine-week plant or a 12-week plant or eight? So all of these things go into that equation and they have to be analyzed. Then it, once we analyze it and we produce that program, um, you know, then we start to look at giving the best practices. So how do you monitor your grow? How do you, how do you actually uh, scout, successfully scout for insects? And, and then, or pests in general. And then once you identify that, you know, what are the modes of action uh, that you go after this pest? And what we see a lot is people hear something about one specific chemical or another, and they think that's the silver bullet. And the reality in IPM, there is no silver bullet. It's all about having multiple modes of action um, for controlling any pest. And we look at biologicals as, uh, uh, you know, beneficials as being one of those modes of action. So when we look at making tank mixes, um, we're actually looking at how do these chemicals all together together. And, and I want to clarify chemical a little bit because it, it, it does throw people off and pesticide scares people even more. Uh, what we're using in cannabis now, we are using naturally occurring chemicals. We do not use any chemicals that we would have used uh, in ornamental horticulture or even in food production uh, because we found that cannabis is a different plant since it can be ingested or it can be smoked. Um, then we have to look at all these different ways that people use that plant to come up with those safe chemistries. And that's part of what Urban Grow uh, prides itself on, is having a compliance person that goes through all of these modes, and not only all the chemicals, but all the states, and in the case of California, all the counties, so that we figure out what is going to keep you compliant um, and give you that success to prevent and monitor uh, and treat your, your insects so your pest problem. So, and when it comes to evaluation, then the grower basically is the one that evaluates our program. And at 45 days in, we actually send out a questionnaire so that we can get an idea of how well we've worked with the customer. And, you know, over the course of the last year, uh, we went from about 20 to 25 cust uh, clients to now 113 programs. So we are writing programs all over the U.S. And, and all knowing exactly what's happening with each one of those clients. Well, that's great. And I'm, I'm part of those numbers of multiple clients. And, you know, it, it's great to see uh, just 
the information provided to us and really watching the IPM, you know, protocols and the standards and the schedules of how we're supposed to treat really make an impact over time. And uh, I've really been a part of that. I want to take a step back a little bit and really talk sure. about, um, you know, when we look at IPM, it's really about the plant and understanding what's going yeah. on in the grow facility. I want to look at this from another perspective as well as it's a multi-pronged approach. And I want to look at when your staff is coming in and out of the facility, I think it all starts from where can this risk come from and where can contamination come from? And you got to start from some of those root areas as well. We know in a lot of these markets, Colorado being one of them, that you know most of your staff is probably growing at home and they're probably going to be bringing in contaminants themselves. And I think it really, if you have the, uh, the standards in place to keep your staff informed on changing clothes, changing shoes, wearing rubber gloves, putting on <coughs> hair nets, types of things, these will really help, um, once again, reduce and, and mitigate that risk of, uh, of any, any kind of an outbreak. And so for us, from a, uh, as, a, as a design standpoint, we really make sure that the biosecurity part of this is, is part of the overall IPM in, in, as a whole, too. And so some folks want to use air showers. Some people are using regular showers. Some people are just changing clothes and using, you know, an overcoat. All these things are great, but just be conscious about where the injury can be for these pests and what you can do to mitigate that from uh, just, you know, walking in the facility. And so all that leads up into what we've been talking about, I guess. And so I want to just make that kind of point here that think about, you know, your entry protocols from your staff coming into the facility first and foremost. Oh, without a doubt, you know, and, and, you know, and, and the other thing you want to think about is if you bring in clones from somewhere else, uh, have a room you know, that, that is, is your infirmary, so to speak, you know, and you put those, those plants in there for 10 to 12 to 15 days so you could see what's happening. Um, one thing we know, especially in the case of clones, um, if you were bringing in clones and you're, and you're in clone domes, uh, to add in a persimilis, which is a, a beneficial insect, um, you know, they do fantastic in clone domes. They like really high high humidity areas. So that's another thought is, you know, you bring in clones, uh, get on a program with us and or, or even buy persimilis directly from us, and, and then you have a prevention program right from the jump. And a lot of people miss the importance of mothers um, and, and the care of mothers because this is where you're taking your cuttings. And if you have, a, for instance, a spider mite problem or, or a powdery mildew problem um, in your mothers and you take those cuttings from that, uh, you're, you're taking them right into your bedroom. So it's simple protocols uh, that you can put into place um, that, that seem like they're common sense, but in the heat of production, they're not always. And, and that's why there's companies like us and like you as well um, that are out there helping to, to get people to think of those little things that they might miss. 100%. Um... I have a quick question. I'm going to interject here. Someone just, just, just chimed in, and they were asking if you could be a little bit more specific on your biological approaches that you consider. And I don't mean to inter interject, but I think this is a good point to kind of bring in this question here to see if we can expand on this a little bit more on just biological approaches in general. And I think maybe a little better explanation on really the, whole, the, the holistic approach to IPM because it's all of these tools that we're using as a whole. Sure, sure. And, and when you think of beneficials, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about predators. Uh, so in, insects like, uh, um, you know, Californicus uh, or the Persimilis, which are our two biggest ones uh, against the two-spotted spider mite, uh, but then also soil soil uh, insects. So we know that a lot of people have problems with root aphids. And, and, and the most effective control for root aphids, unfortunately, um, are chemical controls. And, and we would be more than glad uh, to help people understand how to put that chemical control uh, strategy to work. Um, a lot of that, of course, is proprietary information for us, but, but always happy to help people put together, you know, an SOP type program and make it much simpler, uh, for, for a grower, especially as you 
to consider size and scale, um, deal with these problems and not have to deal with it repeatedly. So, but we also know that with root aphids that we can go after them with, with a theta, which is also known, commonly known as a road beetle. Um, and if we push those populations slightly higher than normal, um, then they will uh, feed on thrip larvae. And once they've devoured the thrip larvae, then they turn to the root aphid. So we have these other controls and this knowledge of how to put these bios together. I do have uh, four clients that are all bio. Um, they do have rescue sprays uh, that we've given them that they could use in the case of an outbreak. Uh, but one producer we have in, in Vegas area uh, is just so impressed with actually being able to use all bios uh, and then being able to tout their product. As, as produced this way. And, and these are the real keys uh, to success. You have to understand which bios there are, and there are a lot of beneficial insects that work very well in ornamental horticulture or bedding plant production, uh, tree production. But in cannabis, because of all the terpenes that we're dealing with, you know, um, and the trichomes, as that material is being produced, then that plant becomes very sticky. Um, and, and so certain bios don't work well. And again, that is one of the things that we explore. I've worked with uh, Dr. Raymond Cloyd from Kansas State and, and many other professors uh, throughout the U.S. to develop these, these strategies and then to try and find out in their research in ornamental horticulture what have they found because root aphids, that's not common to only cannabis. You know, it's all plants. So that's the, the broad view that we bring in. While we only work with cannabis and hemp right now, uh, my 30 years of experience was in the ornamental hort and also uh, in research. So, you know, I ran a third of the research facility at the University of Illinois. I've actually grown just about every plant known to man, and some of them growing them to fail or introducing insects to make it fail. So, you know, not only have I been on trying to make it work, but also figuring out why it doesn't work and how do we resolve that. Great. And so I think this is just once again to reiterate to our audience that IPM is being on a schedule, consistently following through with a plan and understanding exactly what type of pest you're trying to mitigate and just following through what I see quite a bit in a lot of commercial facilities and definitely in a lot of home grows is that people are very uh, reactive, meaning they're going to have a bad outbreak, yes. they're going to go treat it, watch it go away for a month, and they're happy hunky-dory, it comes back six weeks later, they freak out, yep. go spend a bunch of money, spray their plants, it goes away for six weeks, and it's just vicious cycle. And if people pay attention to what's going on, they can really save a lot of money, effort, and time um, if they really just understand what's going on with the plant and what the kind of pest you're dealing with, the life cycles that are associated with it, and what is a good approach with a multi-pronged um, system in place. And so, um, yeah, if you want to add to that, any. Yeah, and I think if we think about it economically, you know, people, chemicals, chemical control is always going to be reactive. You would scout for the problem, or in some cases, you would have the problem because you didn't know to scout in the first place, which is, which happens, you know, we all start somewhere. Um, and, and, and then you spray and you think, oh God, I got it. But the react, the reality is, even, no matter how tightly you build a facility, there are openings. You know, insects need minuscule areas. You think of what a mouth can get through. You know, so now let's take uh, a russet mite, for instance, that you can barely see with a, with a microscope, you know, um, and, and how much space does it need to get in? Where could it hide when you spray? So that's the other thing. We bring commercial sprayers uh, to the to the foray because if you're not getting that total contact and penetration with the type of sprays we use now, there are places for these insects to hide. And and so no matter how hard you try and spray everything, once it dries, it's no longer going to uh, affect that insect. So, you know, that's, that's why we look at a systems approach. And some growers, and, and you know this as well as I do, Alice, this is one of the challenges, you know, that we do face, is they've been, they've been trained 
to do something immediate. Um, and then, okay, I got rid of the problem. But the reality is, okay, that gets rid of, that knocks it back. But now we need something in place that then maintains that. And when we think of beneficials, this is a proactive approach. We are figuring out that level, and for our company, we do it right down to the last insect, uh, beneficial insect that you need, given your production schedule, to make sure that you have that backup, because the reality is, Many of us are great firemen, but who really wants to be? I want a program in place that I can go to bed at night knowing that I have control, that there's something working for me 24-7. And that's what bios provide us with. That's why I hired you guys, exactly, because it allows me to sleep good at night, literally what you just said. And so I'm going to go in a little bit closer here and look at this scouting. You keep using this term scouting, and honestly, I think a lot of the, our, our members may not clearly understand how important it is to scout or what this even means. And I can tell you, um, we've read some articles that have been put out by some very large consulting firms and how you know, they equate to sometimes 20 to 25% of their expenses to growing cannabis they have people scouting on, meaning there's people's sole job eight hours a day and going through, call it, you know, 100,000 square foot of canopy in a week to go and look and scout every single plant, look for damage, look and see what's going on with the plant, take notes, and reporting back to making sure that the IPM is following what they're seeing. And when I read those numbers, that's a very, very large expense that they put into this. And so... Um, I think a lot of folks don't spend that time to scout. I can tell you I've taken over facilities and walked through, and the staff looked at me like I was crazy when I told them every morning, you've got to, first thing you do is take the first 15, 20 minutes, everybody as a team, walk a row, walk a room, walk an aisle, write, write notes in what you're seeing. With these types of processes right. not in place, how do you expect to see this before it's too late? And so this is a big issue I see that is overlooked. I mean, by 90% of the facilities I'm going in, keep in mind, I'm going into distressed facilities because I'm a consultant. They're asking me to come in and turn them around. But this is a common factor right. we keep seeing so much out there. And, and honestly, so when I look at scouting, I, I, you know, that's, that, I, it's really cool that somebody would go that deeply. I'm, I'm not sure you have to go that deeply. I, and, I and our programs assume, assume that you don't scout. Okay, so when, when we write a program, we're assuming no scouting is going on. Uh, everything is, is uh, recommended on either a five-day, seven-day, uh, or, or a 14-day schedule, depending on what we're using as far as chemistries go. Uh, as far as bios go, most, some of our bios go out weekly, but most go out uh, every three weeks. So basically, uh, if you do an all-bio, uh, it would be from week three in veg, all, and every three weeks, all the way, the rest of the way through. Uh, a lot of our, our clients do uh, week one, three, and six in flower, and then some do week three and six for bio release. Now, as far as scouting goes, how would you, how would you really uh, do scouting? In my opinion, you would develop the pests that you have problems with. You would develop a list. You would then look at that list, which most likely is going to be, you know, root aphid, um, uh, two-spotted spider mite, thrip, uh, you know, um, and, and then you look at all these problems and you think, okay, what's the life cycle uh, of this particular pest? Um, so what we've found over, over developing these schedules is basically if you, if you schedule your scouting once a week. So once a week, you're going through all your rooms, you know, and you're actually doing scouting, nothing else, many... Yes, many people try to water and scout at the same time. You can't do that. Your mind can't keep up. You have to say, I'm going to scout. So you would go through your rooms, you would scout, you would look for populations. Um, and, 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 and each one of those pests uh, is going to have a different uh, reaction uh, plan depending on what it is. Spider mites, for instance. If you're finding spider mites, you need to be treating, either through you know, uh, chemical or biologic means. But the other thing you need to do is you need to look at, okay, how many did you find a plant last week? How many do you see per plant this week? Is that more than you saw last week or less? 
And if it's less, then you're actually seeing a declining population and you just continue with your bio program as it were. If it's markedly more, then you have to be start thinking about spraying. And, and that's another thing. Once someone does a program with us, um, and, and they've, they've joined our team and, and provided us with, you know, the, the subscription, uh, fee, then we are there 24-7 from there on. You send me a question on a weekend or you call me on a quest on the weekend, I will reply, not as fast as I will during the week, but I will reply and I'll either, and it might be as simple as, you know, given what you've shown me in a picture or what you've explained, we'll be with you on Monday. And that gives you that peace of mind to know that somebody's on it. Um, so when you scout, it's really important to think of your operation um, and then have that belief once you're in the beneficial realm and you're using bios, have that belief to trust us. We've been doing this for a very long time and we're extremely successful at it and, and we truly are here to help. Well, I can tell you, for the first month that I took over this one facility, my team was calling your guys almost every day, and just the response in general. I still <laughs> brag about the service. So that's the beauty of this: is you guys are the experts. Let's not lose sleep, uh, you know, at night because we can't figure this out. That's what you guys are there for, and uh, it, it it really is a is a, a big relief. And so um, I want to kind of back up a little bit when we were talking about scouting, and you're talking about spraying and and really how important it is to be effective with your spraying. Some of these pests are so tiny, like you mentioned the, the, the russet mite. That thing is barely visible via a, a, a microscope. And so these things hide in the petioles in very, very small areas in the, in the apical meristem. And so you really yep. got to have effective tools to be able to mitigate and access this. And I can tell you, uh, you know, from my long career growing cannabis, you know, we dealt with the hemp russet mite many, 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 many moons ago, and I learned how to how to mitigate it by doing full plant dunks, meaning I had to find a, the right recipe, one of uh, of chemicals to put on it, because I couldn't find a natural way to do it, uh, and two, I learned I had to submerge my whole plant to, to really be effective, and so these sprayers that you're mentioning are super important because they really can 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 be uh, productive as far as saturating the plant properly, getting it in all these areas, because if you don't, you're not doing the job properly. And so make sure you have the right tools, because not all sprayers are created equal, that's for sure. And, and you know, the Ellis, that really, really is true. Um, you know, we have found, fortunately, we have found very effective ways now uh, to control the, the russet mite. And with the sprayer that we use, so we got a spray, got an touch with a spray company um, that has been making sprayers for 60 years. I'm sure they started out with pumps and hand pumps and all that. Um, and, you know, I see a lot of people use battery-powered backpack sprayers and, and hand pumps and, and gallon sprayers. And, and, you know, quite honestly, those sprayers in a small garage or, or you know, 40, 50 plant grow, those probably make sense because economically you can't afford a commercial sprayer. But in the grows that we're working with now and, and as we see the industry expand, you know, you have a room with 500 plants in it and they're on rolling benches and you need to be able to get into all those and throw on to that that you have, you know, multiple generations going on on benches next to it where you can't get that chemical on that table, then these commercial sprayers really pay for themselves because you're able to get up in there and you're able to dial that pressure back uh, to where you can get it dialed in just right for the size of the plant you're applying to. Um, and when we got with that company, then we started to look at um, what could we add to that sprayer that would make it that much more effective. And we got them basically to twist the nozzle so that as that spray is coming through, it's giving it a vortex action, so a spinning, which then helps kick those leaves up and get that penetration up under the canopy. Because under the canopy is what we're really concerned in. And the same thing with powdery mildew. Uh, if I'm treating the top of the leaf, well, yeah, I'm killing the fruiting bodies, but I'm not getting the mother cells that are up under the leaf. And so uh, these are the reasons why, you know, we use these kind of sprayers. And, and now um, Urban Grow has developed a 
uh, a plant monitoring system. So we have monitors uh, that sensors that we put up in the canopy at different heights, and that allows us to track temperature and relative humidity. And, and this one lets us know where breakout points are uh, for powdery mildew. And as we move forward, then we'll be able to start to extrapolate, you know, temperature and humidities uh, that we notice are more beneficial for, you know, our, our beneficial insects, and then what range do we get the best performance? So a new technology that we've developed uh, that's going to revolution IPM, uh, rev revolutionize IPM for us, because now we'll be able to be even more proactive. And, and I think this is the thing when we look at, at sprays and overall uh, treatment of areas um, that's, that's exciting now because we'll be that much more proactive. And at the end of the day, if we can be proactive and we're getting good contact and penetration with sprayers and we're understanding um, all of these components, then that allows the grower uh, to turn to us and to take care of all those myriad of things that come at him or her uh, during the course of the day. Um, and it also allows them to back up why they're doing something, especially early on uh, when they're making that transition from being totally reactive to being completely proactive. Right. I got a, I've got a question here, and I think, um, you know, really it's, it's easily directed, but I want to just put this out there for, so you can s see what kind of questions are coming in. And so this is a sure. gentleman that says he's a, he's, a, he's a California grower, and it's difficult to know which products are allowed and effective. How can I expand the types of products we have to make sure we don't pos test it, don't po test positive for residues and also get effective control? It seems impossible to get rid of spider mites with products from the local supply store. And so I quickly just say, call Urban Grow and they'll get you on a great IPM that will get you off of these pesticides that aren't working. But I'll let you elaborate on that real quick. <laughs> And, and that's generally what I would say, too. You know, we, we do, uh, there is a charge for our services for the course of a year. Um, however, we do give a discount of half of that back uh, after six months as a credit toward, you know, uh, per any purchases uh, in our IPM division. Uh, so that's throwing that out there right off the bat. Number two, when we look at this, we have a compliance person uh, who also is our senior uh, PCA plan uh, in California, and his job is twofold. One, to make sure that they are compliant in every county, and to that end, we worked very closely uh, with the Department of Pesticide Regulation in California um, at the first of the year. We went from um, 22 customers to zero in one day because of the new OIN. Uh, operator identification number required in California to purchase pesticides. Um, it, it was a rocky start in California because a lot of counties didn't even understand that this was coming, and a lot of growers had no clue it was coming. Over that time, uh, we're, we're back up to around 13 customers in, in uh, California, and all of those customers are working off an SOP program developed by us. So number one, we make sure that all chemicals you're using are compliant uh, within the county you're in. Number two, uh, there are chemicals that we can use early in veg um, that are compliant but could test hot uh, if they were sprayed late in flower or even in mid-flower. So once again, this is that service that we provide because we've identified which sprays those are, and if we use them, uh, they are used early in veg, number one. Number two, when we talk to a client, we make them aware of these chemicals um, and that if they use them, they have to follow that SOP. And then if they're not comfortable with that and they don't want to use it at all, then we find something else that we can put in that will give them that control. Uh, once again, looking at two to three to four modes of action for every pest we're addressing, um, and then, and then Gary backing that up, you know, if you test positive, we're going to make sure we, we remedy that situation. Well, the last thing we want to see is somebody lose, you know, 100 pounds or 200 pounds uh, of cannabis and well, once well food because they didn't know that that, that, that 
chemical was hot. The other thing you think about, in the agriculture world, when they switched production of a chemical from one chemical to another, because, you know, many, many chemical companies produce all kinds of different stuff, um, in the ag world, they have a very loose parts per million that they're allowed to have in that next batch. In the cannabis world, it's zero. So we have worked very hard to make sure that we're either working with vendors that only produce one or two chemicals or producers that show us that they have, uh, you know, good manufacturing practices and they, they properly cleanse all their equipment before they go to the next batch. And that's yet another service uh, that we provide and, and really important in California uh, because, you know, as, as you've seen in the news, uh, the state's not messing around there. And, and honestly, this, this whole operator ID number is really a good thing because what California is saying is we recognize cannabis as an agricultural commodity just like almonds, just like peaches, just like any vegetable. So ultimately, that's a really good thing, right? Because it's telling the, the federal government, we recognize this as an agricultural commodity. And as we see that catch, as each state comes online here, then at some point, the federal government has to take a look at that, correct? 100%. They are coming. And so I think that's where this plays into, you know, I've got a question here. Um, that, you know, uh, it, this is getting to agriculture, and people need to realize as they're coming out of their basements and some of the um, the habits that they've picked up you know, in their basement growing and going to the traditional grow store to buy some of the products from there that comes in very small bottles, those aren't really applicable as you scale into this cannabis space, and they, and they really need to look at these other viable products. And I have a question here that's come in asking about, oh, is it, you know, what do you think about um, using foliar sprays from plant extracts? Is it sufficient to manage insects and pests? And I just want to, you know, I, I think those things work great, but on a large scale, do you see these types of products in, in agriculture and, and sold into that realm? And we need to get away from these, um, these, these, these hobbyist-type products is really what we're still people still trying to hold on to in this industry, and we've got to get away from that. Sure, and, and I think to expand on that a little bit more, you know, one thing that Urban Grow has done is when we've looked at these, so you can go to your grow, your hobby store, your grow store, or whatever it's called in your area, and, and they have some, some chemicals that work. The problem is, do they all work? Are they watered down versions? Uh, all of these questions that come into line. And, and, and what Urban Grow offers is we offer, you know, the, the commercial volume of a product. We don't, we do offer some in quarts and pints, but for the most part, we go after gallons and, and two pound jugs and, and two and a half gallon jugs because we're looking at the rate of growth going to use. Um, and then we're looking at, you know, how much do you really need to have on hand and, and what size is the most cost effective to buy? So when you get into a commercial scalable system, you know, what worked in the, in the basement or, or a garage or, or, you know, any kind of shed, um, it's, it changes once you get to that size and scale. And we use many plant extracts. We use neem oil, we use, we use clove oil, we use peppermint extracts. You know, there, there's all kinds of natural, but they're not all created equally. And, and in the case of 25Bs, you know, 25Bs are a great product, but you have to remember they're not EPA registered. So therefore, there's no real testing that went into that product to ensure its safety. Whereas if you're using a product that is an EPA registered product, there has been testing done on this, not for cannabis, but for, for pest control and efficacy and safety. And, and those are the things that we look at as a company. I'm immuno uh, challenged. I have uh, hypothyroidism um, and, and, and then I have asthma. So when I think of the things I put in my body uh, now, uh, I'm very careful. And, and so as I'm looking at cannabis and I'm looking at the clientele that we're treating, all the way from the healthy guy who just thinks he wants to have a good time to, to the terminal ill 
that are trying to control pain, uh, to people that have chronic pain. I've broken six bones in my foot, never had surgery, and it hurts all the time. So I directly relate to all of these constituents that we're serving. And, and so when you look at that whole picture and put it all together, we want to make sure that you're using the safest chemistries, the safest products, i.e. beneficials, and the safest methods that still are ecologically and economically successful. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you a question. I get quite a bit and a lot of pushback on when I talk about IPM and really wanting to use pests to manage other pests especially as we say that we get into the flowering cycle where we're going to get away from spraying pesticides altogether or anything like that and really start to use, you know, uh, pest to manage pests in that, in, in that part of the plant life cycle. And people are always like, well, I don't want to be smoking bugs. I don't want, I don't want to have bugs on my plants during the flowering cycle. So <laughs> help me answer this urban myth that people are afraid that they're going to be consuming all these dead bugs on their, on their flower. And so um, help, me, help me explain this to our, to, to our audience of why that's not the, that's not the case. Sure, sure. So the first thing I, I want people to think about is, uh, you know, um, I, one time I was asked the question, well, what about the excretions? Well, excretions isn't a problem because excretions is what happens when a bug feeds on a plant and beneficials don't feed on it. Well, then once we got the terminology straightened out, they actually meant excrement, which was basically the insect poop. Well, you know, when you think of that, uh, number one, if there's no pest present, then that's not present. If if there is a pest present, yes, there's a little bit of that, but we have a thing called gravity, and, and then we also have, if properly done, uh, we have ventilation in that room. We have good circulating fans that are keeping those plants moving, keeping the leaves moving, and so any degree of that would fall off. Um, and part of that whole thing in keeping those plants moving is also fighting powdery mildew, right? Because if we keep that air moving all the time and that powdery mildew can't sit on the leaf for three hours to get its hyphae through, through the plant leaf surface, um, then, then there's no powdery mildew. So, you know, once again, we're looking at this whole systems approach. As far as the pests making it all the way through to the finished product. I had a guy once, and, and I did actually openly laugh. I, I had to apologize. But he, he said, well, you know, when, when I smoke and it pops, that's a spider mite. Well, no, that would be an immature seed that somehow got in there. Uh, spider mites don't pop. They would melt. Um, and then the second analogy I use is how many people drink apple cider? How many people bite into an apple? You know, orange, any of these fruits and vegetables. So there is a certain amount of, of bug juice, for lack of a better term, that you're getting from all these other foods. But in the case of cannabis, um, California kind of excluded because they don't trim quite to the extent that the rest of the U.S. does. Uh, but by the time you think of, number one, you've cut the plant, so now there's no longer a source for the pest to be there because there's no active photosynthesis going on. Then it gets hung up in a dry room that has a, a, a humidity and a temperature that isn't conducive to the pest or the bio. So once the pest leaves, then the bio is going to leave too. If there's no food, I'm going somewhere else. So, or if I'm in a dry room uh, and I'm at 40% humidity, you know, I can't survive in that anyway. So I die, and again, we're talking about gravity. I fall off. So, you know, by the time you think of all those processes going in, the percentage of, of any kind of bio that you might get um, might be 0 .001. So, you know, the, the chance of even having that happen uh, is almost is nil. And then the secondary part of that is you're ingesting it every day through all the other foods you eat. So, you know, you're getting more from an apple or apple cider than you're ever going to get from a cannabis flower. I've heard there's like 2 or 3% of that material in chocolate, they say, because of how much things get in the chocolate. So you're exactly right. So, you know, the, the, our day-to-day -day consumption of other foods is probably just the same, probably more than what we would get out of cannabis. In the, uh, easily, yeah. All right, so I'm going to kind of play out a scenario here to kind of recap our conversation today to kind of show uh, our audience kind of what we've learned. And so 
I, you know, I've got a project that uh, I'm going to be getting my certificate of occupancy here in Colorado in about another probably mid-October, and we'll be able to move our plants in come um, November 1st. And so I'm going to kind of walk our audience through a scenario that we have particularly taken to show them a process that we are starting from day one really trying to ensure we start with, with clean genetics. And really it does start with where does your starting material come from? And so for us, we yeah. sourced uh, um, clean material from a, uh, a, a lab here in Colorado that does just tissue culture only, and so we're, they're guaranteeing that we have virus-free genetics and disease-free and pest-free genetics when we bring it in the facility. And so this is where it really all starts, as we mentioned earlier in this conversation. I can tell you, uh, you know, over five years ago, I went and opened up a very, very large grow facility in Canada. At that time, there was only about 10 operators in Canada doing this, and so we were able to go and access material from all the home growers at that time. And I tell you, it was like, uh, you know, getting genetics from 15 different growers and bringing in 15 different diseases and problems. That was the biggest headache and issue yeah. I will never deal with ever again. And so from that mistake, and I see a lot of folks doing that, don't do that on a new facility or when you're bringing in new genetics. If no. you do have an IPM protocol in place, have the stuff quarantined so that you can watch it for two to three weeks and really try to mitigate and remove any type of contamination that might be there. And so for this project, we really started by bringing in very clean genetics. It's proven, and it's by a great service here in Colorado. Uh, and then at, at, that, at that point, we're also working with you guys to, from day one, understand exactly what we're going to do when the material comes in and how week to week we're going to you know, follow your IPM protocol and standards to make sure that the system's in place. And so this facility has showers, so the staff will come in and have to have, you know, work shoes that stay there, take a shower, put on, uh, you know, rubber gloves, hair nets, they'll be wearing scrubs. And so all of these things are part of the system so that we know that when we get to the growing side of it, we've taken a lot of precautionary measures to ensure success and reduce that risk. And so, um, you know, from what we've learned today, I'm kind of walking through some of the, our conversations, and this is exactly what I have going on currently. And everyone else should really look at how they run their businesses, whether it's a startup or bringing in, bringing in new material. How do you manage it, and how do you ensure that you're not being re or that you're not being uh, reactive versus proactive? And and I think you couldn't have hit that any more on the head. You know, um, and and that's one of the services that we love to be able to provide. We've had several people that have been growers, um, and many, three of us that have been involved in research, and one, my compliance uh, specialist, actually ran a, a clean room at UC Davis uh, looking into, you know, how to prevent pests in a clean room atmosphere. So we, we have a, a really deep field of experience uh, and knowledge, and, and I think, you know, a good grower figures out how to make things work. A great grower networks with as many people as they can and understands how everybody does it and then begins to put those systems together. And, and that's what Urban Grow is trying to help produce, our great growers, because we've gone out, we've done these programs, we've interviewed all our clients, we've interviewed growers all over North America with what are their problems, what are their, their, uh, uh, responses and how do they take care of it and then putting together a best practices uh, uh, scenario off of that and I think that's what it's all about. I agree 100% and so Todd I'm going to turn this over to you this is kind of uh, we'll wrap this up here as we've got you know um, you know five to seven minutes left here love to have any last comments from you that you like our audience to know here just so that we can you know um, you know sum this up on what we what we discussed today. Sure, you know the, the reality here with with Urban Grow is is we believe that our job is to help advance the cannabis and horticulture industry, as a matter of fact, uh, by looking at all the scenarios that could happen to a grower, talking to everyone we can, going to trade shows, uh, talking to people. I was just in Toronto uh, two weeks ago and 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 met. All kinds of people from, oh, Lord, you know, not only Canada. I met people from Australia. I met people from New Zealand, uh, a couple of people from China. So, you know, we're, we're seeing this as it slowly goes worldwide. Um, you know, we're seeing what people need. And, and so Urban Grow uh, does charge a fee to, to consult for a year. We do develop an SOP-type program that is tailored specifically to 
your grow and your problems. And in that, then we do a quarterly follow-up uh, where we will contact that particular client, ask them how things are going, make sure everything's uh, working, do they have any problems, do they have concerns. At the same time, we are available 24-7 to answer any question. That is what we see ourselves as. Now, I will say on the weekends, uh, you're going to hear from me. Uh, you're not going to hear from my whole team. Um, they need their time off, and, and this is what I get paid for. Um, but, you know, we will respond. And, and we really are committed to producing an SOP program that will allow uh, people to have a fully integrated pest management uh, program. I also do element error plans and fan plans because that is part of IPM, right? If we don't, if we don't have the right climate and in the right environment, uh, then we run the risks. And and so that's why we do this full gambit of trying to look at all the components that go into IPM, and then how can we help clients across North America uh, resolve their issues. Um, and, and that's really the heart of the matter is I'm committed to IPM. I've been doing it since 1990, uh, way before it was cool. Um, and and I, I believe in it. I've been a 100% organic grower uh, at one point. So I've run really the whole gambit and bring that skill set to urban grow and then have surrounded myself with the best people I can find and then empower them to do their best to make sure we produce the best program for growers all over North America. Well, just want to uh, thank you for that answer. And just, you know, to wrap this up, you know, for our audience, you know, really it's utilize the resources around you. You know, if um, Todd and Urban Grow aren't the right fit, I'm sure there are some other sources out there that you can reach out to to help you with these issues, but lean on the professionals. Know what your strengths are. Know what your weaknesses are. If you've been battling with pests from a reactive approach versus a proactive and you can't seem to mitigate, utilize your, your resources around you. There's a lot of great knowledge base out there. We are a, a growing industry in cannabis, and there's some, uh, you know, the, the knowledge base is improving and getting um, you know, m more versed day in, uh, and year out. And so utilize resources around you so that you can be successful. And so with that, um, Todd, thank you so much for getting on today with us. Uh, greatly appreciate it. I had a lot of fun, and this is a topic I'm very passionate about. So thank you for getting on today. Oh, thank you so much, Ellis. And, and just one last thing is, you know, I work with a lot of other people too, so I'm, I'm not trying to say we're the only act in town. There are many people out there committed to this, this cause and bringing the industry forward. 100%. I appreciate you adding that in there. And so I didn't want to make, make this a solely a sales pitch for Urban Grow today. Just want to make, just everyone nope. know that these are great services available out there and utilize your resources around you, folks. Um, I, as a consultant, I lean on them as well to provide this service for us because they are the experts. I know what my core is. And for me, I want to align myself with the best. And these guys allow me to sleep well at night, as we mentioned earlier. And so um, Todd Statzer from Urban Grove, really appreciate your time today. I want to thank our audience for, for tuning in today uh, to the American Cannabis. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Cannabis Tech. I am your host, Ellis Smith. Uh, this will be um, uploaded onto the American Cannabis Company website and hosted there in the next few days. I would say sometime early next week. So thank you for tuning in, and have a great weekend, everyone. See you next month.